Okay. So, um, so the, um, the, 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 the Slavs, from their own point of view, are the people of the word. From the point of view of people around them, for a while at least, they are people who can be, who can be enslaved. Um, so this brings us to uh, what I want to talk about next, which is who they were at the time. So again, before Europe, before the conversion, means before literacy. So we know less about them, right? So I mean, the, the, the history, this, is, this may seem like a bit of a cop-out, but history is based on written records. And so you know, we have the history of ancient Mesopotamia and history of ancient Egypt, legitimately the history, because they left documents. Um, we don't have the history of their neighbors necessarily because their neighbors didn't leave behind documents. So when we're talking about the history of the Slavs up to this point, where the sources we're using are Jewish travelers or Arabic travelers, right, or maybe Christian missionaries. And just the most basic principles of source criticism would, would tell you that these monotheistic visitors are going to have a certain kind of bias towards the pagans that they see. But those are the kind of written sources we have up until, up until the Christian conversions. But we, so we, but we, we, know, we know some things, but we know less than we, know less than we might. Um, we know something about the paganism, but because these people were not literate and because they didn't have temples and they were aniconic, that is, they didn't have icons, uh, they only started to have temples and icons, that is, physical instantiations of their divinities, in t very late in the day when they were influenced by the Christians. But on their own, they didn't, and so there isn't really a physical trace, not just not a written trace, but there isn't really a physical trace of how they worshipped. But we know, so we know, we know something. Um, we know that, uh, that they were, as I've said, that they were pagans. Um, that means that there were, there were a number of gods, and the gods were not necessarily divinities separate from the world. On the contrary, they were connected to, to the world. Um, they were connected with things that happened in the world. This will be familiar from Greek or Scandinavian mythology. The, the, actually, there are pretty, there's pretty strong similarities between this and Scandinavian mythology. So if you think of Thor, um, not in the most recent movie, not that Thor. Like I did, I thought the most recent one didn't really work. I don't know about the rest of you. Like I was in, I was in Vienna and I was with a seven-year-old and a ten-year-old, and I took him to see the most recent Thor movie, and like it turns out that it was like seventeen and over. It just seemed weird to me, and um, and I said like together they're seventeen, and they're like okay, <laughs> and they looked away. And I took them, but. It wasn't really a six, I don't think that last Thor movie really worked. Yeah. Anyway, but if you think of Thor, the, the, the Scandinavian divinity, you're not far away from Pedoin, who is a central divinity um, in, the, in the Slavic pantheon, a god of thunder associated with the thunderbolt, um, also associated with the, with, with the oak tree. Uh, another important god was called Svadog, who is associated with the sun and with, and with the crops. But the spirits and the divinities were everywhere. Um, so that's the thing about, like, about monotheism. It's not just that there's one God. It's th that that one God is often located somewhere else besides Earth, which is a very strange thought if you're not used to it, right? Um, like there's something, there's, something very, there's something very ascetic and demanding and disciplined about monotheism where you put God somewhere else besides here. Like there's a way in which it's much more comforting actually to have the gods kind of around all the time, right? Um, okay, so the gods were everywhere. Um, and the notion was that you are in constant relationships with them, which explains things that we now treat as superstitions. Uh, the things that we now treat as superstitions, are the little physical actions, are, 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 are gestures towards the gods. Um, sacrifice, human sacrifice, would, would be part of these relationships, sacrificing the right kind of person at the right, kind of, at the right time. If you spent any time in the Slavic world and you think about it, you'll... Notice that the sacrifices to um, the, sacri the, sp the spring sacrifices and the summer sacrifices to water and to flame are both still present in the culture. Um, they're, they're now ritualized and nobody gets hurt, but the, the rituals are still there. We can talk more about that if you want. Um, the, um, the dead are still with you. That's another part of this, of the, of these, of this pagan religion. Um, the ancestors will help you or they will hurt you. Um, your, your kin relationships extend to the dead members of your family as well, and so you're supposed to continue to do certain rituals um, in their direction, um, which is not really so strange if you think about it. Um, at the end, uh, very, important was, um, very important was the end of life. The end of life is something that had to be very carefully, met, very carefully looked after 
because if not, then, then the dead are angry or the dead are, the dead are irritated and the dead don't do the things that they're supposed to do, instead they do other things. Which is a very fruitful source, by the way, for our own culture and probably more fruitful all the time. Um, the, if, 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 if death is not handled properly, then the dead are unquiet. Um, and how is, what's an improper death? Uh, if you're drowned, um, if you commit suicide, if you're hanged, all these things, if you die during childbirth, um, if you die on your wedding day, which frankly I get it, I mean that's, that does seem like bad news, um, and, uh, and, and, if you're, and, if you're not, and if you're not cremated properly, right? So the, it, religions have ways of physically handling death, not just narratively, but physically, and so cremation is what's supposed to follow. A f the female unquiet death, unquiet dead, this is still quite popular in the Czech lands. Like if you have anything to do with Czech culture, you'll have heard of these, of these creatures. Um, Urusalki. Um, Urusalki are water spirits or meadow spirits um, that, again, like, like a lot of, like, actually like a lot of pagan stuff, this shows up in Tolkien, um, things like this. Like if, you know about, like if you know about Slavic paganism and then you reread Tolkien, there'll be a lot of things which pop out at you. Uh, but they sing you or they lure you into the marshes, the Rusalki. So they're very beautiful and they're very attractive and they, they, know, how to tr they know how to draw you in and then you drown. Um, the, um, or sometimes they tickle you to death. I don't know what to make of that, but that's, that's a possibility too. Uh, the, the male unquiet dead are, it's an easy one, but from Eastern Europe, still with us. Yeah. Yes, vampires. The male, a male unquiet dead is a vampire, right? So, um, and you know what vampires do? The vampires, they come back, they feed on, they feed on the blood of the living, um, they take the souls away, they start with the family, right? So when Bram Stoker brought the vampire into Victorian culture, he was working with an actually existing pagan tradition. And the reason why, um, so it, it appears, and this is now, again, this is not from historical evidence because we don't have it, but it's from, it's actually from um, archeological evidence. It appears that when the Slavs did convert to Christianity, which again, don't worry, we're gonna talk more about it in the next lecture. But when they did convert to Christianity, there was a, there was a vampire crisis, which you can imagine, right? Because suddenly nobody was being, like even, even if you do convert, and remember conversion, like when conversion is, prevent, is presented retrospectively, it's like boom, like the leader dunked himself in the water and suddenly everybody was Christian and you know, that's it. But it actually takes generations or centuries and there's usually lots of backtracking and rebellion and so on. And even if you convert, um, I, it, it's a pretty dramatic thing and it's very unlikely that you will instantly get rid of all of your previous convictions, right? And when the convictions are very high stake convictions, like, oh, sorry for the pun, it was not intended, um, but when the convictions are very, like when they're very significant um, convictions, like will my loved ones come back after death or not? You may want to hedge your bets a little bit. So when the Christians came, the Christians said, no, no, don't cremate in, in Hume, bury, right, bury. But that's not a proper way to die, right? That's not a, that's not a proper way for, and so the way, that, the way that the Slavs handled this was to keep, in order to keep the male dead down, they put stakes through the bodies so that the vampires couldn't come, just in case, just in case, right? And so hence the notion that the way to stop a vampire is to put a stake through the heart, right? So these, so these, you know, these, things, are, these things are very old and very interesting. All right, so um, how, how do we get then um, from no written language to written language? How do we get from paganism to Christianity? I'm gonna talk about the details of this next time,